Windows Server 2012 is ushering in a brand new era of manageability, and a lot of its new capabilities are built around Windows Remote Management. We've got a lot to cover, and we'll start by talking about WinRM, or Windows Remote Management, and WSMAN, Web Services for Management. We'll talk about compatibility with these features across different versions of Windows. I'll show you how to enable and configure remoting, how to actually use one-to-one -one and one-to-many remoting. This one is the cool one. And I'll briefly show you where you go to set up custom endpoints and, and describe why you might want to do that. One thing I want to point out is that there's a lot of potential configuration scenarios, cross-domain, domain-to-workgroup, uh, all kinds of different stuff. Some of them get complicated. So I've put together a free ebook, which you can download, no registration required, called Secrets of PowerShell Remoting. You can get it from PowerShellBooks.com. Uh, it's something that several people in the community help me update from time to time. So check back every so often for the latest version. It's in all the popular formats that you kids like these days, PDF, Mobi, EPUB, whatever. And it's mainly a series of screenshots just to walk you through all of the major configuration and troubleshooting steps. So keep that in mind as we get started. Okay, first of all, the mandatory architecture discussion. Here's how this thing works. You got a computer out there, some server or even a client computer that you need to be able to manage. This thing runs a service called Win. RM, or Windows Remote Management. That talks a wire protocol called WSMAN, or Web Services for Management. That can run on either HTTP or HTTPS. You actually set up what's called a listener. HTTP is the default one that gets set up, and if you want to take the time, you can set up an HTTPS one, which will encrypt the connection. So traffic comes in. HTTP or HTTPS, talks to WinRM. WinRM passes that off to what's called an endpoint. Now that endpoint represents an application and a configuration. So that might be PowerShell. It might be some other application entirely. Microsoft is going to start moving away from using the old management protocol, RPC, Remote Procedure Calls, they don't want to use that anymore. It's a pain in the neck with firewalls anyway. And they want to start shifting all administration traffic, all management traffic over to this new model. So a server might potentially have several different endpoints hooked up to it. When you talk to a server, sort of the envelope says what application it's intended for. Now again, it, this is an application and a configuration. As you're going to see in a second, PowerShell actually sets up several endpoints by itself, each with a different configuration and different purpose. And I'll talk about what that means later. And you can set up your own. And that's uh, what PowerShell calls a session configuration. WinRM calls it an endpoint, session configuration, all kind of the same thing. So that's the architecture here. That's This is what you're going to be using and playing with. Now let's actually well, dive in and use it and play with it. The first thing you'll need to do is enable remoting. And you can do that on a per computer basis by running enable PS remoting. It's already enabled on Windows Server 2012. It does not hurt to run this command again though. And I want to do so just that you can see what it's going to do. It's going to either start or if it's already started, restart the WinRM service. It's going to set that to start automatically from now on. It will create a listener to accept HTTP requests on any of the computer's IP addresses. And it will enable an inbound Windows firewall rule for that traffic for HTTP. So let's tell it we want to continue. Telling me it's already set up. That's fine. Yes, I'm sure I want to do all these crazy things. It's now going to try and create several different endpoints or session configurations. This is the default one. This is for 64-bit PowerShell. It creates another one for 32-bit PowerShell. So that's kind of what I was talking about, application and configuration. This endpoint, Microsoft.PowerShell32, is set to run PowerShell in its 32-bit mode. There's also one that's designed specifically to run PowerShell workflow and one that Server Manager uses for running its workflows. Okay, so that's all set up. Uh, we can now... Shift over to the WS man drive and we'll connect to localhost. 
And all of these represents things that you can configure as part of this. So let's go to the service and see what can be configured there. Uh, you've got a security descriptor language. So that's the SDDL that describes who is allowed to use this thing. Max concurrent operations, some timeout things, whether you allow it to be used. If you look at shell, you'll see some PowerShell specific configurations. Let's go to listener and there should be one listener configured. Yep. This one is configured on HTTP, which uses port 5985 by default. You could change that right here. And it's listening on all of my local IP addresses, including IPv6. So that's where you can kind of configure all of this to do whatever you want. There's lots of different settings in here. Now, you can enable all of this and configure all of this through group policy. It's kind of complicated. There's a lot of different steps. So rather than show it all to you here, that's what that Secrets of PowerShell Remoting ebook is for, is to walk you through all of those different books. And it's like 100 pages of screenshots and configuration, depending on exactly what you want to configure. I also want to point out a little caveat. Client computers, so Windows 8, Windows 7, whatever else, they don't have this enabled by default. So the remoting is not turned on on them. If you want to enable it, you need to be aware of something. Windows will not allow a firewall exception to be created if any of your public networks are set to, or sorry, any of your network connections are set to public. So you know when you plug in a new uh, network connection and Windows 7 or Windows 8, it pops up and says, is this home, is this a work network, or is it a public network? If any of them are set to public, Windows Firewall won't create the firewall exception, so remoting won't work properly. Uh, that's just a Windows thing. If you look at the help, help enable PS remoting, there is a switch to skip that. So you can kind of force it to happen. Nine times out of 10, if you have a network set to be public, it's one of those virtual network adapters that something like VMware Workstation or something will install. That's where that often comes from. And it's really difficult to change those things, especially on Windows 8. So you might just want to run it with minus skip network profile check, if that's what you need to do. So just be aware that that's there. Now let's briefly talk about compatibility. PowerShell version three comes with Windows 2012. It comes with Windows 8. It is available as a free download for Windows 2008, so that's server, Windows 2008 R2, and Windows 7. It is not available for Vista, or XP, or Windows 2003. Version 2 of PowerShell is available for Vista, XP, and Windows Server 2003. Versions 2 and 3 can talk to each other using remoting. So if you have these older machines, I'm looking at all you people still running XP out there. If you have those older machines, you can install PowerShell version two. You can enable remoting the same way I just showed you how to in, in version three, and you will be able to cross communicate between version two and version three. Not all of your capabilities are exactly the same. When two different versions of remoting talk to each other, they kind of have a little, a little handshake process where they decide what their capabilities are but 99% of what you need to do is gonna work just fine. So what might you want to do? Well, there's a couple of different ways you can use remoting, and the first is called one-to-one. -one. It's essentially the same as getting an SSH shell in the Linux or Unix world. I'm gonna get a remote command line prompt. So I'll use enter PS session minus computer name, and I've put a computer name on my clipboard, so I'll just paste it in there. In a domain environment where both you and the remote computer are in the same or trusting domains, this pretty much just works. In any other situation, you may need to do some different configuration stuff to get things to work. That's all covered in that free ebook, Secrets of PowerShell Remoting. So my prompt now indicates that I'm on a remote server. You can see it there, the computer name at the beginning of the prompt. I can get a directory, uh, nothing in that directory, so that wasn't that much fun. I can get a list of running processes. I can run whatever I want to. I'm on the remote machine. When I'm finished, exit PS session, prompt has now changed and brought me back. 
Something you need to keep in mind is this concept called the second hop. So I'm here on computer one. What I just did was create a remoting session to computer two. I delegated my credentials across the network. Now that's all done securely using Kerberos. I'm not transmitting passwords or even my username all in clear text. It's, it's delegation. Any commands I run, the remote computer is going to run as me, meaning whatever I have permission to do, I can do. If it's audited, it still gets audited. So this is transparent from a security perspective. It's, it's like I walked over to the computer, logged onto the console and ran those commands. However, for security purposes, by default, your credential cannot be delegated across a second hop. So this is the first hop. If while on that remote session, I asked it to go to another computer to do anything that involved network access, that is a second hop and it is going to fail. In fact, I'll, I'll show you exactly what happens. All right, so here we are. Let's do that same enter PS session to get me to the remote computer. That's the first hop. You can see that I'm on the remote computer. I'm gonna ask it to remote to itself again. So it's gonna go back out to the network and try and open another connection to itself, and it failed. And it's actually giving me an error message that's intelligent. Hey, you're currently in a PowerShell session. You can't enter another one from here. Oh, okay. I need to go back to my computer. You can enable the second hop. You can make that work. And there's some completely valid reasons for doing so. You might not be allowed to connect directly to all the servers in your data center, for example. You might need to first connect to a gateway or a bridgehead, and then from there get to whatever server you're going to manage. You can enable that. It involves, uh, well, I'll show you. Help enable WSMAN cred SSP. There's this separate protocol you have to turn on and configure. It's not a big deal, but it does have to be done, and there's a little bit of thinking and planning you should do first. Again, all covered in that Secrets of PowerShell Remoting Free ebook. So just download that. All right. Being able to do one to one remoting, getting a remote shell on a remote computer is cool, but it's not nearly as cool as this. I want to run a command. What command do I want to run? Let's keep it simple. Get event log. Let's get the, I don't know, security log and just get the newest, uh, newest, I don't know, 50. And I want to run that on multiple computers. So I want to run it on that one. Oops, don't want to select one, paste. I want to run it on localhost. You can string as many of these things up as you want. Hit enter and boom. It even adds a column, look at that on the end, that tells you what computer each result came from so that you can separate them out, sort them, group them, whatever you want to do. Uh, for example, let's do that again. I'm going to pipe it to sort. I'm going to sort them on PS computer name, which is the name of that column. Typically you're going to get them back in chunks anyway. There's no need to sort them, but it's not guaranteed. So I'm just going to take the time to do that. So I can then do a format table and have them grouped by PS computer name. So now I'm actually getting a separate table for each of the two computers. So you can do whatever you want to with this thing. Let's show you the help for that invoke command. Cause there's some stuff to talk about there. By default, this will only talk to 32 computers simultaneously. That means your machine, whatever machine you're sitting at, is essentially running 33 copies of PowerShell, the one you're working with, plus the 32 that are being used to communicate with remote computers. If you've got a ton of RAM on your computer and there's no reason your boss shouldn't buy you 64 gigs of RAM, you can boost that throttle limit and talk to more than 32 computers simultaneously. If you've changed the port numbers that remoting is using, you can specify alternate port numbers using other parameters. You can tell it to use SSL if you want to. And, and these are all in here. They're a little hard to find. There's port, use SSL. Um, you can feed different options. You can feed it an alternate credential. If you need to use cred SSP, you can feed it uh, that as, a, as, as an alternate option. So all kinds of options in here that you can play with. But the ability to send a command to multiple computers, have them execute it and have the results come back to your computer is flat out amazing. And this is at the heart of how Microsoft is managing going forward. I told you in the, the first nugget where we talked about server manager, it uses this under the hood. You don't have an option to turn off remoting. You can't manage 
server 2012 without remoting because even the local tools require remoting to talk to the local server. Given that all the tools use remoting, well, there's really no sense in ever managing the server on the console. Just sit comfortably at your workstation, nice air-conditioned office, cup of coffee by your side, maybe a far side page a day calendar to keep you amused, every comfort of home right there in your cube or your office. And you're going to have the exact same management experience because all the tools are technically managing remotely anyway. So this is, this is really cool and really important stuff. And so there's just one more thing that I promised to show you, and that is a couple of commands. Here's the first one, new PS session configuration file. This allows you to define a new endpoint. Now, all it does is create a file, basically an INI file, but you can tell it, look, when someone connects to this session, I want them to only get, um, oh heck, there's all kinds of stuff you can put in here. I want to run this particular PowerShell version. I want the following functions to be defined. I want the following variables to be defined. I want the following aliases to be defined. So you can, you can set the language mode for PowerShell, restrict it. You can automatically load particular modules. So you create that session configuration file. It sits on disk and then you run register PS session configuration. This actually reads that file, takes some additional parameters and creates the endpoint. So one of the things you specify is the configuration name for the endpoint. So that's the name people will specify when they want to get to the endpoint. You can specify who is allowed to connect to it. You can say that I don't want to run things under their permissions though. I want to run things under these permissions. So one of the things you could do, for example, is create an endpoint that only loaded a particular command. Like it might load the entire Active Directory module, but only expose, and there's a, a, a switch in here called visible commandlets that will let you decide what you want to expose. I'm looking for it in this gigantic list of, of parameters, but it's in there. You can say, I only want to expose the command that lets someone reset a password. I want to let my administrative assistants connect to this. So I'll set that as the security descriptor, but they don't have permission to reset passwords. So I don't want the command run under their permissions. I run it, want the command run under this run as credential, this secret credential that I'm putting into the background. You've just created delegated administration. You're allowing someone to do something they don't have permission to do, and you're allowing them to do it in an extremely restricted and controlled fashion. This is pure awesomeness. You might then write a little graphical user interface on top of it that connects to the, the endpoint under the hood using PowerShell, but presents a GUI to the user. So you've given them the ability to do something they don't have permission to do only through the restricted mechanism you have provided, so they can't do anything else. There's amazing possibilities and use cases for this, so definitely something worth thinking about. And again, that Secrets of PowerShell Remoting walks you through a lot more possibilities and complete examples. So if it's something you think you're interested in, then grab that thing and dive right in. So as promised, uh, I talked about WinRM and WS Man, kind of showed you the, the structure of how all these things work. Talked about the compatible versions, how to enable this, although you don't need to on server 2012, it's enabled by default, but you still might want to configure it to do different stuff. Showed you how to do one-to-one -one and one-to-many remoting. This is what server manager actually uses when you tell it to configure multiple computers. It uses remoting. Showed you where you would go to set up a custom endpoint. And there's a ton more information about that and all of the, the sort of outlying configuration scenarios in that free ebook I mentioned, Secrets of PowerShell Remoting from PowerShellBooks.com. I hope this has been informative and I'd like to thank you for viewing.